Good morning for those of you in the African continent and good afternoon for you uh, in China and in Asia. Welcome to the third session of the ISS seminar on Africa security partnership with China, looking into the future. This morning's session, which is the last session of this two-day seminar, will be looking into how Africa and China can strengthen the quality of their partnership through multilateralism, multilateral institutions, and other types of global arrangements in terms of global governance. For those of you that have attended yesterday, we would like to thank you for your participation. And for those of you that are attending for the first time, welcome to this third session of the seminar. This morning, we have five fantastic speakers joining us, both from the African continent and from China, that will be reflecting on one of the biggest questions of contemporary global politics. How do countries connect better benefits from the use of multilateral institutions and a rules-based order? What the role that organizations like the United Nations play in ensuring that uh, the future of the African continent is more stable and prosper? What is the role played by regional organizations, including the African Union, in ensuring long-term stability and peace, for, uh, peace in, in the continent as established by Agenda 2063, but also by providing platforms that can elevate voices from the global south, like China, like Africa, by pulling together resources, pulling together ideas, and ensuring that collective responses are beneficial not just to the few, but to the majority of the globe. We have here five fantastic speakers, which each of them will be talking and reflecting on different engagements around Africa and China security partnership and multilateralism. That includes the role of the UN Security Council and how the three African member states or the A3 engage with China and other member states within the UN Security Council. They're going to be talking about the increasing role of China in peacekeeping operations. They're going to be sharing issues around counterterrorism and how regional organizations play a role and what China can or has been doing in terms of strengthening the continental capacity to support, but also how other types of arrangements of global governance arrangements with the so-called group diplomacy we see in terms of the role of the G20 or the role of BRICS, but particularly in the context of the upcoming FOCAC meeting where is increasingly becoming more institutionalized and playing a role within this wider and broader context of group diplomacy that we have been seeing. Uh, we're first going to have Dr. Stephen Kuo from the University of Cape Town, which is going to be sharing some remarks. And he recently wrote a fascinating book on the role of China on security uh, issues, particularly in terms of peacemaking and peacekeeping. So Stephen, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Gustavo, and thank you very much uh, to the Chinese Embassy uh, for organizing this event. Um, <clears throat> I have seven minutes, I'll just get into it. I have a book published, Gustavo mentioned, on the Chinese peace, which is based, which, which based on field work I carried out in Liberia and South Sudan, and a, a good deal of it to understand what is the Chinese approach when it comes to peacekeeping, peace building, and peacemaking Africa. Um, so I'll, I'll go into it now. Let me begin with a anecdotal story. So I was, and I begin with the same story in my book. It's about 2010, and I was still a graduate student, and I attended a conference on the liberal peace in London. And uh, I, I suppose, I was only half jokingly, I said to some of my fellow conference goers, I think they were Germans, um, I said to them, look, when it comes to building sustainable peace in Africa, right, would it not be interesting if we examined the Singapore model? I didn't even go as far as the Chinese model. And I remember that they sort of, and I said, look, Singapore was a colonial, was a colony of the British. It's quite a few different countries, different ethnicities. Um, and I think everybody here sort of gets what I'm trying to get to. In a way, if you want to build sustainable peace in a 
country, for example, Liberia, or South Sudan, you know, other African countries, which are creations of uh, uh, col colonialism, then it perhaps would be useful to examine different ways of building sustainable peace. And the wisdom, as it were, given to Denmark, uh, competitive elections, free market, perhaps in that model that the U.S. has been pushing since the end of the Cold War and the ways of pushing since the Cold War, perhaps that is suitable for some, but not all instances. Hence, I wrote and I researched about, is there such a thing as a Chinese approach or indeed a Chinese model? And, and, and I wrote a book on it, so I, I, I get a lot of flack because people tell me that oh, there's no such thing as a Chinese model, things change and, and move, and, and, and I know. The intention for me of writing the book is not to tell you this is precisely what the Chinese understand, rather this is my interpretation and a summary of what I think the Chinese approach to peace, uh, keeping, building and making is. So that's that's my take. That's, so, so, so let me go into it now. Right? So it's my summary. It's not directly from the Chinese government. This is how I understand the Chinese understand how to build sustainable peace. So there's three things I think that's that's very key, or three pillars, right? Sovereignty, uh, respect for sovereignty, non-interference. That's absolutely number one. Very important from a Chinese perspective, and uh, most of us know the reasons why China suffered from colonial invasions, suffered from the war from Japan. It does not want any more interference in its domestic affairs, right? So that's important number one. Um, the second. The second pillar that, are, that is very central from a Chinese perspective when it comes to peace, uh, building peacemaking uh, via the United Nations, it's political stability, right? And national interest. Stability supersedes everything. Stability supersedes individual rights, group interest. It's important that the group and the society remain stable, right? And uh, finally, and this is very much the Chinese model of since reform and opening up, state-directed, infrastructure-led economic development, right? So China has grown rapidly because it has had a developmental state in, in many ways where the government says, right, let's build infrastructure, let's, uh, let, let's focus on economic fundamentals first, right? So differentiating the Chinese piece from the liberal piece there, right? So if you, if you look at the Western model of peace building since the cold, end of the Cold War, the liberal piece focuses on individual rights, uh, whereas the Chinese piece focuses on collective rights and focuses on, 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 on poverty alleviation. It focuses on bringing everybody out of poverty and, and so they can be economic progress, right? So that's a, so the, so that's, that's a key difference, as well as where's the liberal piece focuses very much on a new constitution um, and, and elections very quickly. The Chinese piece focuses on let's, let there be a strong and efficient government first, first and foremost, and then we can talk about um, elections at a later stage. So those are, those are so I, I summarize or interpret these other sort of like differences between the Chinese approach and uh, or the Chinese model, if you like to call it, and, and the liberal peace model, right? So um, I can only just touch upon it, but I encourage you to, 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 to get hold of my book. Um, as far as collaboration between the Chinese side and African Africa side, um, I also have three points that I'd like to contribute. Um, the, the, the work that I'm working on now, and, 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 and in many ways, it looks at Chinese IRR scholars, right? Professor Qin Yaqing, as well as Professor Yan Xuetong, Chinese IRR scholars looking at Chinese IRR theories. And, and these two professors and others look to traditional Chinese philosophy to find political philosophy, to find uh, uniquely Chinese contributions. Um, if, if I can embarrass myself and and, and, and speaking, speaking Chinese because it's, it's a correct translation. Um, it's in the Analects, uh, 
and and、uh, 景齐公问政于孔子，孔子对曰：“君君臣臣，父父子子。” Right. So, Book Jin of Qi, he asked Confucius about government, and Confucius replied, "There is government when the prince is prince, when the minister is minister, when the father is father, when the son is son." So, from a Chinese perspective, it's not so much the rights of the individual. Rather, it is the relationship in the correct position. So the emperor, or the, or the prince, is needs to act appropriately. The relationship with his minister, the father appropriately with his son, and 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 vice versa. Right? The father is supposed to treat his son with benevolence, and the son, in in return, treat his father with respect. When a society has the correct relationships. That is a harmonious society, right? So this, I think, I I think this is quite central from a Confucian、um, aspect. I explained this to an African scholar and academic, and to my surprise, he said, "Steve, this is intuitively,、um, intuitively correct from an African perspective, because of course we've we've been born to." Right, people are people through other people, correct?、Um, and I refer to my 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 late late Ian Taylor, my my PhD supervisor. He, he had written an article criticizing the liberal piece, and 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 the 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 nub of his argument was that the liberal piece has a one size fit all. You have an election, you have free market,、uh, off you go. However, where Ian Taylor points out. With the with the West is ignoring is the the breaking down of social relationships in these African countries that that's had civil war. You just come through and you say, look,、uh, heavy elections, and then and then you don't try to understand and fix the broken societal societal、um, issues. So the relationship is broken there. The society is no longer harmonious. So it seems to me that. In addition to the three pillars I just mentioned, the Chinese、uh, focus on economic development and infrastructure building, fixing relationship, societal relationship、um, that has broken down in a conf conflict society. That that is that is something the liberal peace misses, and I I, I think and and I, I I argue that this is where Chinese philosophy can be. Of use and will find echo in African society. And finally, it seems to me that a critique on negative rights, right, human rights and and civil rights, a, a, a traditional critique、um, by Karl Marx. So Karl Marx wrote、uh, a short book called On the Jewish Question in 1843. Those of us who took political philosophy at university. And Karl Marx actually makes a similar critique about human rights and negative rights. And the critique is: every single man does not, or every single person,、uh, does not live in isolation, right? A person is only a person when he lives in society, in community with other people. So, so Karl Marx's critique against,、um, I suppose, human rights or, or the rights discourse. Is that you guys are isolating a person away from his natural、um, environment, which is、um, with other people. So it, it so 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 that's that's sort of three arguments, I suppose, I have on relations that 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 China and Africa, African countries, perhaps can find、uh, a, a commonality.、Uh, firstly. Relations that has broken down, and that's that's why. And and if you if you able to fix that, right between the have and the have nots and the elites and the normal people, perhaps that's the way to build sustainable peace.、Uh, it seems to me that this particular understanding of relations in society has African roots, and finally, from a Marxist perspective, there is also a critique against. Pure negative rights. So, so 
I have relative, I have sort of pushed quite quickly, but um, if you I'll just, stop here. Yeah, stop thank here. you. No, thank you, uh, Stephen, and, and, and you really bring us a lot of food for thought, which I hope the other speakers are also going to touch upon. And uh, there's a number of issues that you raised that I think are quite important on so understanding not only the Chinese approach towards multilateralism and how they engage uh, on issues around stability of sovereignty, uh, the issue of this, something that we've been discussing a lot since yesterday around this intertwined relationship between peace and development. Um, and I thought the critique that you provide in terms of liberal peace is quite an important one. Because I think that it's something that most of us in the field have been questioning ourselves, what will come after the liberal peace model, that it's not necessarily uh, a very easy answer and looking into different alternatives and different models is, it's quite useful. I think just as a brief comment before I give the floor to Professor Liu from Peking University is that uh, liberal peace often tends to to look into to peace processes and long-term peace processes in a very bureaucratic way and often at a very event-based and full of benchmarks and as you well mentioned uh, uh, around building um, having elections and so on but it's also uh, very much concerned around building institutions uh, which uh, seems very much in line, at least with the broader thinking, when you bring the the the, an, the example from from Chinese philosophy around building those institutions, and it would be interesting to discuss further around marrying these two issues around sovereignty on one hand, but also helping to build not just elites for particular states, but also in terms of their own capacity of the states, even if we're focusing purely at the state level. Uh, and I think there is the fundamental question of whether collective rights and human rights are intrinsically opposite to one another. And I think it's something that may, may, some of the speakers may be able to touch on that. So I don't want to take much time from our speakers. So uh, we have now, and thank you, Professor Liu, uh, for joining us. Uh, and you have the floor, and thank you so much. Uh, thank you, um, the, um, the chair. Let me just, uh, um, according to what you call upon us and also uh, what uh, Stephen has uh, um, very eloquently elaborated, I think uh, my point and his can be very much, um, uh, 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 a, how, how to say, as you, uh, the chair, you suggested, since he has been focusing on the state perspective, mine has been rather focused on um, the uh, non-state or society perspective. So my talk um, has been rather about uh, uh, development for peace on the security. I use uh, some of the cases to show how it is also important that uh, the new Chinese collaboration with uh, or current Chinese uh, collaboration with Africa on security issues can also enhance from such a way either from you know bilaterally with African continent or beyond the continent multilaterally. Uh, my starting point was really trying to reflect a little bit about uh, uh, the current literature has been really focused on um, the multilateral way or real politics perspective and then uh, either demonize the Chinese uh, security collaborations or uh, don't necessarily uh, understand from the continental perspective a lot. So I start from this uh, and then trying to encourage a kind of a holistic per uh, 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 perspective. And then I think uh, um, uh, to understand that such an approach is a very important to say how China does and uh, have a probably different views and then if not a completely view about its contribution for Africans' uh, security and the sustainable peace. And then from the beginning, which uh, really go way back to 1950, when the relationship is just established, we have noticed how anti-colonial uh, has been one of the, or most of the important uh, um, uh, the, the task for China 
And then uh, we also realized that since 2006, the first China white paper on Africa, and later also 2012, 2015, all have elaborated more about specifically how to address uh, Africans' peace and security issues. And then we also have noticed the scholar have paid more attention to such as the China African Security Forum, and then to, in 2019, those kind of things. But I think uh, how to really understand that from a holistic perspective is still lack of. For instance, my own uh, research uh, goes back to 10 years ago when I first visited Liberia, I visited our uh, peacekeeping camp. And then I noticed, and then also across uh, the talks among those uh, soldiers and then also um, Chinese officials, they elaborate a lot about how they have used sort of a peacekeeping diplomacy. Mm. With that, it uh, goes about how not only to contribute to peacekeeping keep, this mission directly, but also they also contribute to scaling the local and contributing to health service, so on and so forth. And then I think this kind of a point have been also lately related um, uh, 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 so, and analyzed by some African scholars and then other um, uh, think tanks. They all agree, seemingly Chinese, even the peacekeeping mission has some things uh, different. I think all this have um, uh, revealed a, a, a fact that Chinese so-called perception about uh, how China can contribute to uh, African security and the peace. And if we look at the whole uh, com a component of China's contribution to African peace and security, we notice that not only the peacekeeping, but also of course, yeah, economic uh, activities, be it infrastructure or, um, you know, strategically uh, training people and then all this economic development contribution, how they can also uh, combine with this kind of a, a peacekeeping mission to contribute to Africans' development. I think this is something very important, even during the COVID, we noticed that uh, there are many countries, my own research goes to uh, like uh, South Sudan, uh, our friends and then have uh, sent us so many uh, pictures about uh, during this moment, how they are still contributing to the local economy by training and also by investing diversifiedly. So this of course also demystify de uh, a kind of a uh, narrative of China as a thirsty oil dragon. And then we can actually say how so many different sectors are uh, uh, having China's investment. So with that, I'm reflecting um, uh, Chinese scholars' latest uh, discourse or the ongoing research. People have been um, emphasizing so much that uh, probably we can call the Chinese approach as a kind of a developmental uh, peace approach because uh, just as uh, Stephen already uh, elaborated about, about the differences uh, between the liberal approach and the Chinese approach, I think there are also several things we can elaborate from non-state or non-politics uh, perspective emphasizing how the economic activities from society perspective, from human being perspective is very, very important. With that, I think a fact, a hard fact is that the demographic situation for large a group of people are just uh, use uh, with this use vouch uh, challenges across the continent, how use if there is no opportunity maybe for their whole life and they can easily join either rebel or join to violent group or becoming 
any kind of a criminal element. So I quote my own students, um, Barak, he has done his research about the South Sudan's case. He emphasized with that, with Chinese trainings, because this is based on his lots of interviews to those who have been trained. He, they, they actually simply told him after training, their life have been changed and they, they actually started to be recruited by government, even the government uh, dominated by a different ethnic group. So we are suggesting potentially maybe this kind of ethnic politics or in another word we can call it this clientship politics can be changed, the evil circle can be break uh, and then there is a future that how the um, economic activity can also in another way to uh, help with the politics to solve those kind of dialogue with which we talk so much about ethnic or tribal uh, politics. So coming back to what Chinese scholar has been discussing about this developmental peace approach, I think we have been chunking several dimensions such as economic growth, effective government and governance, and then also right to survival and uh, development, which according to, I think ID, either ISDG or other uh, the principle, international principle, we call that this is a basic human being, um, uh, human right to be able to survive. And then to, to talk about effective government and governance, I think the Chinese also the government or other uh, actors also have been helping a lot about capacity building, such as uh, for the security, for the peace, um, the, the capacity. We, we know many uh, facts. I don't want to repeat here, but I think uh, uh, the Chinese envoy last time when she was uh, Miss uh, Ambassador Xu, when we had a talk, she emphasized uh, China's peace and mediation, if uh, we can call mediation, uh, didn't based on kind of Chinese idea, Chinese solutions, but rather to promote African solutions. I think this is also a very strong evidence to show how the Chinese approach are helping with government and governance of uh, uh, Africa. So um, I, um, uh, Chair, I, I don't know whether I still have any minutes. I think you just left. went over time, but we we can come back to okay. you a bit later. Okay, okay. I stop here because I want to emphasize that again from African perspective, but I stop here and then I wait if there is a chance. No, thank you so thank much. You. And we will have the chance to speak more about some of the issues that you have raised and fascinating points around that. And and and, and the one interesting thing, and I think would be interesting for us during the chat to talk more, is the impacts of the South Sudan experience for China. Many of us working with peacekeeping operations would remember in the 2000s, China was definitely not in the map when we were looking into troop contributing countries and certainly in the last 10 years not only the, an increased deployment of chinese peacekeepers on the ground but effectively becoming by large the largest permanent member of the security council in terms of deployment becoming a very important contributor i think from from your presentation and i think the one thing that uh, it's quite interesting for me is this issue around governance and government development and, and economic growth and we once again come with the idea of intertwined developments. Uh, the one thing that is often missing for me, and maybe it's my own ignorance on that, is any reference to the idea of peace building and sustaining peace in terms of how do we know that these things that we are doing, whether in terms of economic growth or governance or governments or development and so on, effectively are contributing to our intended goals of peace and instability. And I often find that 
Uh, there is a risk that a peace building discourse become too Western dominated, but also in terms of ensuring that that intentionality that it's so important when it comes to peace building issues is also present in there. It seems somehow implied, but I think maybe it's something that we can discuss further. Um, I'm going to move to our next speaker, Faith from the Institute for Global Dialogue. You have the floor. Uh, good day. Thank you, Gustavo, and to the ISS for uh, engaging me on this um, conference. And I think as a starting point, the task before me was to just give a bit of an overview um, and focusing specifically on China's evolving role in the African peace and security landscape with a focus on um, its contribution to multilateral UN peacekeeping operations. But in saying that, I think it will, it's also important to remember at the back of our minds that in as much as we, we talk about peacekeeping, it's important to, to remember that it's a very multifaceted uh, peace and security engagement by China in terms of its Sino African relations. So, in addition to peacekeeping, there's also a component around military diplomacy, there's a component around corporate and citizen security, there's a component around um, humanitarian relief, uh, and also the, the non traditional security engagements like your piracy and your humanitarian um, elements. So, in saying that, I think as a background, uh, let's remember or let's re-engage and ask ourselves why at this, up, up until this particular point, we've seen an upscaling, uh, a skilled engagement of China in terms of the UN peacekeeping operations. And the basis for that one would argue is that there's a marked attitude and event policy shift from Beijing's perspective in terms of reconciling also its role as a uh, a global power as a responsible power and in line with its broader logic of peaceful rise. So, and and on the other back of it also is the question of, yes, it's it's um, engaging and extending its imprint in, in terms of an African-China relations and, and there's significant economic uh, gains, there's significant political benefits, but also in securing its economic interests, there has to be a security component, particularly if you look at it from the perspective of the BRI, there has to be a security component of the BRI. So for that reason, then we see China becoming markedly more um, assertive abroad and it's, it's expressing greater influence over um, a greater geographical range. So in, in understanding this, this rationale for its greater engagement, particularly in peacekeeping, it's important to remember that there's ideational considerations, but there's also material considerations. And when I talk about ideational motivations, I'm talking about the influence of socialization. So as China has become, has become more integrated, it's, it's, it's uh, poised to become um, a more active, a more responsible power. It's poised to become also more engaged, more integrated in, in community of states, this international society. And then when you align that with the grand strategy of peaceful development and also the vision for community, of, uh, a community with a shared future for mind, can then you begin to see this picture of how the, the ideational uh, motivation is shaping up its, its upscaling of its engagement in peacekeeping operations. But there's also the notion of these material considerations. And here I'm talking about certain political, certain economic and, and certain um, military benefits from engaging in peacekeeping. I, I can expound on that later. There's also feed, a feedback mechanism. So this complex learning processes that come from engaging not only in multinational drills and operations, but also in, in multilateral peacekeeping operations. And when when uh, when you when you get the Chinese military also receiving those feedback um, components and, and feeding off its integration with, with the government perspective, then you begin to see how that impacts its continued um, and, and increasing engagement in peacekeeping and in, um, multilateral peacekeeping operations on the continent and also abroad. So having talked about that, I'll, I'll be very quick in talking about military diplomacy because I think it's important to contextualize that and how that also forms a broader picture of the peace and security engagement. So obviously military diplomacy being the engagement of, of the military in peacetime activities, what the Chinese call military operations other than war. Um, and also the idea that military diplomacy in this case is seen as having very pragmatic rules and also very transformational rules. So building and cementing already the, the relations that were there with the African states. 
and also we have military exchanges and, and dialogues. Here I can use the example of South Africa, for instance. There's a um, China and South African Defense Committee that has been in place for over 58 years. So this idea of functional dialogues um, and exchanges and, and training is, is a key component of, of the engagement. Back to the question of peacekeeping, I think just to give you a few statistics. So since 2007, China has been the leading trip, trip um, contributing country in the, within the, the, the five permanent members of the United Nations. This is a particularly interesting subject because it talks to us about when you look at the, if you go to the UN website and the, the peacekeeping website and you look at the list of the top 10 contributors, China is at number 10 as of this year's um, statistics. And you wouldn't see obviously any other of the 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 piece of P5 members. That that is quite telling because it for me it speaks of the 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 contribution of China in terms of putting its money where it's um, where it's talking to where its its mouth is. So if it's talking about multilateral peacekeeping, it's it's looking to actually uh, ensure that its financial contribution is in line with its engaged peace, uh, multilateral peacekeeping engagement. So that's that's from a, a, a troop contributing perspective. From a, from a financial uh, perspective, it's the second largest financial contributor of the UN peacekeeping budget, about 15.2% of peacekeeping costs. And then also at, at the dialogue level, China is increasingly contributing to debates and dialogue about, for instance, a key, a key element has been one about how to enhance the safety of peacekeepers China has been keen that it's funded a study um, about that, particularly if we look back at what happened in um, 2013, where there was a loss of, um, with, with the, the UN mission in Mali becoming increasingly uh, one of the more dangerous missions. So there's that um, aspect that China is contributing to. And also the debate about fielding Chinese um, officials to top levels in, in UN um, the peacekeeping department. It's interesting here, just a note to, to make that. So there's rumored, um, there's a rumored report going around that China might be expressing interest in, in putting up uh, nominations to head DPO. And DPO has traditionally been led by the French, I think from something like the 1960s. So that's an interesting consideration, this a very keenness on the part of China to also field um, nominations for key uh, peacekeeping posts at the UN level. There's also the idea that when you look at reports coming, and this is something that um, Prof. Maifan mentioned, that when you look at China's engagement in peace operations in Africa particularly, it's not just the lowest ones, it's also the highest ones, the ones in Mali, um, where, they, where you see China taking over sentry posts, for, in, for, in, for instance. This has received commendation to a large level in showing that it's not constraining itself mostly on the marginal or, or, or taking up a peripheral role. Add to that, then I come to three other elements, and I'm just mindful of time here, is the question of also juxtapose what I've just mentioned about um, engagement with UN peacekeeping with the idea that China is also, and this is one that is overlooked, China is also a part of its um, engagement on the continent comes as, uh, in, in terms of its supply of arms to, to the African continent. It's, Africa received 16% of Chinese arms exports uh, between the period 2016 and 2020, which accounts for about 5.2% of global arms sales. And here a contentious point comes in terms of the recipient countries in sub-Saharan Africa of Chinese arms, because it's a question of how then does it reconcile with the talk of um, the broader notions about developmental peace, the broader notions about authoritarianism, the, particularly the, the arms sales fall into authoritarian regimes. This has been a subject of debate for, for a lot of commentators. And we can touch on that later. Then augment that also with the idea of mediation. Um, Gustavo mentioned it about the South Sudanese rule. Um, and if we think about the Chinese diplomatic engagement in South, South Sudan, its peace facilitation role under the auspices of IGAD, one then is forced to ask whether we need to read increasing Chinese engagement as a function of also augmenting its economic interest, the question of oil. But in moving beyond oil, um, following what Daniel Large has argued, he poses a very interesting question, whether we should look at mediation, Chinese mediation role, particularly in South Sudan, whether it's a predilection towards 
experimental attempted solutions that have been moderated or adapted in the face of um, direct experience or whether it's almost falling back to the question of the inevitability of an evolving peace and security landscape on the continent. Um, very quickly, it's the question also of profit and citizen security, which I think is important. I'm not going to touch into that um, a lot, but the background is that, for instance, in 2011 with the Libya uprising, China was had to make plans to evacuate over 40,000 Chinese workers. And I think this has been in the back of the mind of, of um, creating a very multifaceted engagement. So in wrapping up, then a few questions that I need to put out there. What does UN Chinese engagement in UN peace, increasing engagement in UN peacekeeping mean when we look at the robust turn in, in UN peacekeeping? And here I'm talking about the PLA casualties in Mali and South Sudan, which not only unnerved Chinese officials, but also edged it and, and motivated the, the, stand, the study on the safety of UN peacekeepers. What also does this mean in terms of Chinese engagement in peace and security on the continent? What does it mean in light of a resultant global militarism that we're seeing in the context of strategic competition? This idea of, um, and, and here I'm, I'm referencing the, Ch the Chinese defense white paper on the need for military modernization by 2035. What does that mean in terms of metrics, uh, procurement, operations and maintenance, um, et cetera? And also the idea of China as a non-shaper how, um, on one hand, we talk about it adapting to, to exigencies of the African peace and security landscape. But also the other side of that, the other question, um, the other face of it is, how then can we also consider that Africa has shaped the Chinese understanding and, and its movement away from this idea of non-interference in, in a very static term, in order to, to have a more pragmatic, more fluid approach to, to addressing realities. Um, and lastly, also, are we going to see, uh, Prof. Kuo talked about Chinese model of, of peace, um, markedly different from the liberal peace. Are we going to see peacekeeping with Chinese characteristics, particularly because if we look at its engaging, um, increasing engagement, not only in debates on peacekeeping, but also the kind of role that is played as a net provider of security. And also in the back of mind in conclusion is the question that we need to remember that China also, Chinese engagement also in peacekeeping means that it, it has to tread carefully um, in view of the, that larger context. The fact that peacekeeping also means navigating the relationship with other major powers, that's important to remember. And also how in, in developing a significant stake in US, UN peace operations, it also has to look at how there's, there's uh, an evolving landscape in peace and security. There's a geopolitical question that comes as far as peace operation is concerned, and there's certain exigencies that come um, with, with, the, with the peace and security landscape on the continent. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you, Gustavo, and um, I hope I haven't taken too much time. No, thank you very much, Faith, and, and you really raised some critical points when it comes to not only the evolving landscape for China in engaging on peace and security matters, and you're specifically focusing mostly on peacekeeping operations, but I think the questions you raised are extremely important because for many years we keep talking about this idea of a commitment gap where the most developed countries in the world tend to pay for peace operations, but the developing countries tend to be the ones deploying. And of course, China is somehow breaking a bit of that commitment gap by being a strong contributor in terms of assess contribution to the UN, but also a strong deployer. But we cannot forget that one of the reasons that why a lot of developed countries stopped deploying in the 90s was very much in response to what you mentioned, Faith, about the fear of increased casualties, and that led to some kind of a distancing. And why but if, especially when you're deploying in situations where peace is not very clear and often where you don't have any peace to be kept, that the chances of using Chapter 7 mandates and robust, robust missions may actually increase to somehow of a new reflection and that it's more of a question than a comment. I think the other point that you raised that is extremely important is how will China and Africa engage in a very changing nature of peacekeeping itself? We see a very low appetite from the UN Security Council to deploy large peace operations. We've seen the rise of ad hoc security initiatives like the G5 Sahel or MNJTF 
really taking uh, somehow the position that once it was, we would have expected that traditional peace operations would, would do. And what would then China do in terms of its own engagements coming forward? But the other thing that you mentioned, and it's around the civilian role that China plays within the headquarters and within the missions. And considering that increasingly the expectations is that special political missions and missions deployed by the Department of Political and Peace Building Affairs may gain prominence in the coming years, it would be very useful to see how this idea, and going back to what uh, Dr. Kuo was mentioning in the beginning, how China will bring its own idea of a norm shaper, because to some extent there is part of the discussion are discussions that have not necessarily been initiated by China, but China is part of, but a part of it is also China also bringing its own ways and its own rationalities around that. So I think there is much we can discuss. Uh, let me not take much more of the time from the speakers and I'll go straight to Professor Wang from the Chinese Academy of Social Science. And thank for joining us, sir. It's okay. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Kahvalo. Uh, I will thank, uh, first of all, uh, the IIS very much for inviting me to this very important meeting. Uh, the issue of security in Africa is a permanent and realistic uh, topic, especially in the, this context of the continuous spread of COVID-19 pandemic. Africa is facing no more complicated and uh, interrelated uh, problems. The intervened problems of terrorism, separatism, uh, transnational organized crime, food security, and the climate change. The topic of my speech is uh, achievements and uh, prospects of uh, cooperation between China and Africa in the field of peace security issue, my speech is divided into three parts. First part, achievement. Based on general principle of uh, diplomacy of China, the main platforms for China-Africa multilateral security cooperation include the United Nations, the African Union, and the sub-regional organization. In recent years, Especially since the Johannesburg summit of the FOCAC, China and Africa have continuously expanded their cooperation in peace and security affairs on the three platforms. Achieving rich results with the cooperation level more and more high, the projects are increasing and the gains fruitful. One, at the UN level, the main areas our China Africa cooperation include the following jointly maintain the authority and the leadership of the United Nations in the field of global security governance, maintain international security order and a governance framework, jointly promote the international community to pay more attention to and invest in Africa, and especially support the international community to promote the realization of security through development. Maintain Africa solutions to solve Africa problems and avoid unilateralism and excessive interference. interference. China has become the country with the most troops among the permanent members in UN peacekeeping missions, which is conducive to maintaining the core position of the UN in security affairs. Second, at the a, a, uh, uh, African Union level, support the enhancement of the African Union's security governance capacities, uh, innovative, innovative security governance uh, concepts, improve the security governance framework, and enrich security governance uh, method. China also provides financial support to the African Union, as well as training and logistical uh, support. 
in accordance with the China-Africa Peace and Security Plan. China has established the China-Africa Peace and Security Cooperation Fund and the China-Africa Peace and Security Forum. Three, at the sub-regional level, support African sub-regional organizations to improve the framework of security governance, including the construction of the standing army, the enhancement of regional security management and intervention capacities under the leadership of the African Union, uh, logistic support, etc. China strengthens its cooperation with sub-regional organizations to support the countries in the Sahel, Gulf of Aden, Gulf of Guinea to maintain regional security and uh, counter terrorism. Second part, uh, achievement. One, Western countries question the existing multilateral security governance platform and the framework. The impact the impact of U.S. government on the authority of the United Nations during the Trump era, the impact of the egoism, uh, its meaning selfishness, and America first thinking of Western countries in the context of the current epidemic. epidemic. The, the propaganda and the impact of African failure countries in the area our Western media. Two, the challenges of unity, unilateralism of Western powers. The United States and France have reduced their military dispatch under the framework of the UN. And their security cooperation with Africa is now mainly through uh, bilateral channels, which has a certain benefits in helping African countries improve their security governance capacity. But their drawbacks are also significant, especially to UN and EU. Three, under the threat of the epidemic and economic recession, Africa's self-confidence has been impacted. National governments capacity have been weakened. Military goodida threat of terrorism and piracy and organized crime are rampant. Uh, the tasks of multilateral security cooperation have increased. International support has decreased. And the credibility of multilateral cooperation has been challenged. Third part, perspective. Uh, one, we should resolutely maintain the core position of the Union, uh, nation, United Nations Organization in International Security Governance, the leading position of the African Union in African Security Affairs, and the dominant uh, position of sub regional organizations in regional security affairs. Two, uh, maintain the security concept of Africa proposed, Africa agreed, and Africa lead. Three, actively advocate common responsibility, uh, safeguard common interest, and create a safe and co-constructed China-Africa community with a shared future. Four, Establish a new security concept that is common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable. Oppose military good data and force to resolve political issues. And maintain economic and social development to promote peace and security. Five, positively evaluate the African security governance framework and uh, counteract Western media's uh, uh, defamation. Uh, the above is my speech. Thank you all. Thank you so much, sir. And and uh, and I think you raised some really important points. And I was 
about to wonder when the African Union would be mentioned in these discussions, and I'm really glad that you did. Because particularly when we talk about a lot of the multilateral responses to conflicts in the continent, often the African Union and regional economic communities are increasingly in the lead of those. Uh, and certainly there is the, all the, basically the elephant in the room for the last couple of years is how do we reduce the, depend, the, the dependency that regional organizations in Africa have to, from external support, and especially the ongoing discussion within the UN Security Council around the potential use of UNSS contributions to African-led operations that would enable them to be more sustainable and predictable. I think it's also a very important point that you make regarding the issue around emerging threats uh, in the continent, because that's is definitely something that is already impacting the way in which responses are done, whether it's through transnational crime, whether it's through climate change, as you mentioned. So there is certainly a lot that we can reflect around that. So let me not take the time for last but not least speaker, uh, 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 Dr. Paul Nantulia from the African Center for Strategic Studies. And you have, uh, you have the floor now. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to ISS and to colleagues. Uh, it's truly an honor uh, and a privilege uh, to be joining uh, so many Chinese and African colleagues that I know and whom I've shared other platforms with uh, on other issues uh, concerning China-Africa relations. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, I would like to uh, pick up on some of the discussions that have that have uh, that took place yesterday and also this morning with uh, very good presentations uh, and I specifically want to highlight the issue of African agency in uh, Africa China relations because if we go back to FOCAC to the establishment of the Forum for China Africa cooperation um, uh, was an initiative if you look at the conversations uh, on the Chinese side with Chinese uh, scholars uh, it becomes uh, clear that um, the initiative to establish FOCAC as a permanent mechanism for collaboration between China and African countries came from the African side. Um, the African countries were very worried at the end of the Cold War that uh, the continent was going to be marginalized uh, by the great powers and were very keen on developing uh, these types of mechanisms uh, that could ensure that African countries remained relevant on the global stage. So I think that is one example of Africa agency. The other example is on the peace and security side, because uh, FOCAC has evolved. Uh, it was initially, if you will, uh, very commercially oriented, trade oriented, uh, but it eventually picked up on the peace and security issues. And now one of the areas that uh, FOCAC is handling with African countries is support for the African peace and security architecture. Again, uh, that evolution has seen a lot uh, of agency coming from the Africa side. So it's very important uh, to situate uh, this conversation within the perspective of, uh, of Africa agency. And still on the issue of agency, uh, if we look at the buildup uh, of the forthcoming uh, eighth FOCAC, uh, there have been numerous uh, avenues uh, of engagement that have brought uh, African scholars and Chinese scholars together. Uh, actually, I presume more than any other time in the history of FOCAC, this particular FOCAC has seen uh, such numerous platforms, right? Um, Professor Liu uh, and myself uh, about a month ago were in another platform uh, that was looking at uh, China's role in uh, revitalizing uh, the peace process in South Sudan. Uh, which was hosted by uh, the, uh, an organization called Crisis Action and um, the China Africa Project. And it was interesting to see African and Chinese colleagues uh, hearing one another out uh, and trying to look at um, uh, what sort of uh, uh, initiatives were required to push uh, uh, that process forward. So there have been so many of these platforms and I would just like to, um, uh, to highlight that it is very positive uh, to see that uh, African and Chinese colleagues are, are, are discussing these issues much more uh, regularly. Uh, my remarks are broken down into three parts. Uh, I'm going to discuss the main factors that shape Africa-China security cooperation very briefly. I've been asked to look at the security dimensions of the Belt and Road. 
and how China and African partners cooperate on peace and security. Let me start with the factors that shape uh, Africa-China security cooperation. And I identify uh, three main factors. The first is history and context. Uh, Africans and Chinese have been interacting for centuries, uh, dating back actually uh, more than uh, 1,200 years. Uh, we can go back to the Tang Dynasty. Uh, we can take it all the way up to the Ming Dynasty. Um, if we look at, uh, for instance, the um, voyages that uh, the Ming Admiral Zhang He um, uh, conducted uh, to different parts of the world under Ming China, and uh, diplomatic and trade relations, which were established along the ancient Silk Road um, with pre-colonial states in southern and eastern African coasts, um, and which China is now trying to rebuild uh, as one belt, one road. So there's a lot of historical uh, reference points that are extremely important to bear in mind. The next high point of uh, Africa-China relations came during the anti-colonial and anti-apartheid struggles. Um, which were mostly framed within the framework of anti-imperialism. Uh, China's record in uh, supporting these struggles is well known and uh, need not be repeated here. But I, this, again, is very important in terms of the historical uh, framing. Now, one of the things is, um, you know, that one finds is, you know, there's a tendency to dismiss all this as irrelevant, uh, ancient history. Um, but, you know, I did a study um, last year uh, that was looking at, um, uh, you know, peacemaking and, uh, you know, the application of soft power from a Chinese philosoph philosophical perspective, uh, which I call the Tao of uh, soft power. And uh, one of the arguments that I put forward is that, um, you know, no serious analysis uh, of China and Africa or China-Africa relations uh, can afford to know the powerful role that history plays in shaping the contemporary relationship. And this also applies to the peace and security front. There are quite a number of uh, common points and similarities um, between African and Chinese culture. Um, the first is that um, they're both deeply rooted in the past and take their cues from historical memory. Uh, second, they share similar self-perceptions of which one of the most important is to be treated with dignity and respect and have their experiences validated. The third is that uh, the two cultures share a common stigma of colonization, underdevelopment, and backwardness. Although China has transformed its situation considerably, that basic stigma remains. And this, I argue, explains why Chinese and African civilian and military leaders, and even scholars, uh, are able to find common reference points uh, despite these, uh, these differences. So history and context are extremely important. The second major factor is what I would call the mutuality of interest, the mutual interest in shaping multilateral security norms and practices. Uh, this is a key factor. Um, now, individually, uh, African countries, I argue, do not have the financial, economic, and technological power to shape international relations to their advantage. Uh, but I argue that this has been compensated to some extent by their efforts to become uh, proficient uh, especially in international peacekeeping operations. So if you look at small uh, countries like Rwanda, which is currently the world's second largest troop contributing country, they punch way above their weight. Countries like Rwanda punch way above their weight at the global level uh, due to their peacekeeping commitments and experience. So this is one way that African countries have tried to assert uh, some kind of influence uh, at the global level. Uh, and China has played a very important part in that. But what is also very interesting, if you look very closely, is that China also follows a very similar path in trying to um, reestablish itself as a global leader in its own right. Uh, peacekeeping operations uh, have become extremely important avenue uh, for that. So this is a commonality that China shares with its African uh, partners. I mean, a decade ago, uh, China's multilateral security uh, uh, initiatives were really minuscule. But lately, China deploys more peacekeepers, as, as, as colleagues have argued, than other Security Council members uh, combined. It's the second largest uh, contributor to the UN's uh, peacekeeping budget. Uh, it has set up uh, uh, quite a number of uh, new initiatives of the United Nations, such as the UN Peace and Development Trust Fund, which consists of the Secretary General's Peace and, uh, Sub -Security, Peace, uh, and, and Security Sub Fund and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Trust Fund, which are being accessed by African countries. Uh, China has also placed 
an 8,000 strong standby force at the disposal of the UN Secretary General for deployment to crises, uh, uh, to crisis spots. Now, such initiatives, I would argue, would have been unthinkable even 10 years ago. Um, so the China-Africa partnership on peacekeeping is really truly strategic. Uh, I mean, four African countries are on the list of the top 10 contributors to the UN uh, missions. Uh, Africa hosts the largest number of multilateral missions in the world, and African missions account for 75% of all UN military and civilian peacekeeping personnel. So again, there's, a, there's, there's an element of uh, Africa agency because China's path to building a leadership on the global peacekeeping stage had to run through Africa. China relied on its African partners to gain operational experience, to gain knowledge, and to become familiar with the peace missions environment. African countries, on the other hand, benefited from China's financial and diplomatic resources to develop and expand their own capabilities and amplify their role on the world stage. So this, in short, was a partnership of mutual interest. The other factor is uh, China's growing political profile, which shapes Africa-China security cooperation. And a very good example that we've all discussed is the Belt and Road, uh, which of course is one of China's most important strategic initiatives. Uh, there's a tendency to view it merely as a series of economic projects, but it's much more than that. And uh, one of the things that we will look at, for instance, is the degree to which African countries have been able to shape the Belt and Road and to convince and persuade the Chinese side to align the Belt and Road uh, programs with certain strategic African initiatives, such as the program for the, develop for the development of infrastructure, as well as the memorandum of understanding that was signed between China and the African Union on aligning the Belt and Road with Agenda 2063. So this is another key uh, factor. Sorry, Paul, uh, can um, I ask you maybe to just wrap up your presentation? Yes, so I'll just uh, briefly touch on the security dimensions of the Belt and Road, and there are really four that are identified. The first is the, the geostrategic nature of the initiative. It's a, it's, it's a large initiative uh, covering, um, uh, uh, you know, over, over 100 countries uh, that have signed up, including 44 from Africa. Uh, so this obviously uh, has obvious security uh, dimensions. Second is the wide dispersal uh, of major uh, Chinese investments and assets. And we've seen, like in the case of Sudan and South Sudan, sometimes these assets are targeted uh, by insurgent groups. Um, and that obviously creates a security uh, dilemma uh, for China and its African partners. The third is the difficulty in monitoring numerous state-owned enterprises that are operating in different time zones and in different countries and locations, which sometimes are very difficult to reach. And in the fourth security dimension of the Belt and Road, are what I would call, uh, you know, which stem from international uh, perceptions as well as local uh, perceptions. And that is something that we can discuss uh, further uh, in, the, in, the, in the question and answer session. What are the different levels at which Africa and China collaborate uh, on peace and security? I would uh, say five levels. The first is a post-conflict reconstruction. And in the, in the case of South Sudan, for instance, uh, colleagues have been, uh, have been suggesting as a recommendation uh, to closely align uh, Chinese uh, contributions to infrastructure, education, health, and so on, uh, within the within the framework of the developmental peace uh, thesis, more closely with the post-conflict reconstruction agenda of African of African countries. Second, uh, our coordination on the multilateral level that we've already discussed. That is another uh, instrument that uh, Africans and uh, Chinese uh, uh, partners are collaborate on peace and security. The third uh, is the bilateral level activities, the military to military cooperation, military education, police and law enforcement uh, uh, cooperation. And then the final one that uh, we don't normally discuss is mediation. I mean, China is actively involved in supporting mediation efforts in nine armed conflict situations in Africa uh, and Asia. And I think this is another emerging area um, uh, that China and African countries are, are, are pursuing uh, on the peace and security front. So I think I'll stop there and, uh, you know, um, identify uh, more issues in the, in the question and answer session. So I thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Paul. And I, and I think you bring some really interesting points. And I love the fact that you started your presentation with 
uh, talking about African agency. And I think largely what we aim to do at the ISS with our initiatives on enhancing the role of Africa in the world is precisely the issues of agency. But I also thought it was quite interesting what you mentioned around the more regular interaction between African and Chinese counterparts. Because I think to a large extent, many times that we have a challenge of interaction, it's not simply about an ideological problem. It's also about an issue around not knowing one another is an issue about cognitive dissonance that comes by different perspectives. Uh, and, and, and that it's particularly important if we highlight the, the points that you mentioned around the importance of history and context and how does it mean in terms of this emerging field of South-South cooperation, which you, of course we can go into more details around and question around this relationship amongst equals, but certainly brings the new, new dynamics and, and ways in which we can uh, engage with. That being said, I wanted to give the floor to my colleague, uh, Dr. or future Dr. Chidu Mutsangadura from the ISS. She has been tracking and leading some of the online discussions and those uh, hopefully will lead into some food for thought for each of our fantastic five speakers. Uh, Chidu, you can share with us what is the pulse in the, our chat room. Thank you, Gustavo. So we had some uh, very interesting comments and, and discussions. It's been actually a very active chat box. And the first one was actually a response to um, Dr. Stephen and what he was talking about, the restoration of social relations, um, you know, post-conflict and the alignment, the philosophical alignment between China and Africa in terms of this. And so this led then to questions around, uh, you know, when one looks at it from an African perspective is that the transitional justice mechanisms in Africa, focus on restorative justice, um, sometimes, you know, um, you know, over punitive measures. And so the question was, what is China's then specific approach to that, to transitional justice, especially locally owned and locally driven transitional justice mechanisms? And then, um, you know, and the, la and the next question that actually came was a very good rebound and a follow up to something that Paul mentioned, which is the question of, African states leveraging, uh, you know, multilateral um, institutions to have their voice, to, to sort of um, amplify their voice on an international stage and the role of China in this. And so we had a question that was looking at, you know, how then can African states better leverage uh, their multilateral engagement and strengthen their collective positions within global debates and China's specific role to that. And I think then the question then goes to, to Paul to just kind of um, to just kind of expand on this a little bit and then the question of balance actually came um, and this was actually the biggest debate and the biggest discussions was around balancing the developmental peace approach so how does it balance uh, you know like everybody has um, you know said agree that it's a pragmatic approach right that after a conflict, we need strong institutions or strong government, and this is a priority. But then the question becomes, at what point is this then, should there be an infusion of values such as then, when do we look at rights and when do we look at elections and when do we look at establishing accountability mechanisms? Um, and then, you know, just um, also then, uh, the debate also went up from just China's um, approach in specific states to a multilateral approach and how then does China infuse and institutionalize some of these values because when one looks at the question of rights within post-colonial states and where they've had a, um, a history of imperialism, it looks very different from the liberal idea of individual rights where there's a, a focus on group rights. But how then is this infused in multilateral structures such as the UN that have such a focus on liberal, liberal rights? What has China's role been in trying to actually make sure that from a lateral, multilateral position, um, multilateral level, there is an um, there is an acknowledgement of the role of group rights and self determination. Thank you so much, Chido. And we have 15 minutes left for, for, for this discussion. So what I wanted to do is to go through the same order that we started uh, and ask you to maybe choose one of the questions, one of the comments that were made, uh, and for three minutes uh, maximum. 
just to share your comments. Uh, I will be a bit abrupt and interrupt you, so I apologize in advance. So uh, let, let's start with Stephen. Uh, can you just uh, pick one of the questions and comments and just share some of your thoughts around them? I, I quite, I'd like to pick the first question about transitional justice. Um, I think that's fascinating. And, and, and just to frame the debate around transitional justice, and then, I mean, I grew up in South Africa, so after apartheid, there was a, a very, very well-known TRC, right, here in South Africa, the Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission, chaired by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And uh, I'd imagine everybody knows the, the, the context. The idea is, if you would come out and admit and explain the, the wrongs and the crimes that you committed during apartheid, then we will forgive and forget. If you don't come out and explain the wrongs and the crimes that you committed during, the, during apartheid, then the full might of the law will come after you, right? So, so, so that, that, that was, it's quite, it's very interesting culturally, legally, philosophically. When I mention Confucianism and about how Confucius is very keen on social harmony and everybody had, it needs to be in his place, right? In order for there to be social harmony. Confucius also had something to say about justice, right? Um, I don't remember the full quote now, but the, the Chinese people here can correct me. He said, Yi zi bao yuan, right? So the, one of the students asked Confucius, should I repay somebody who's done me a wrong with kindness, right? Should I, the Christian term is, should I turn the other cheek? And the Confucius replied, if you were to reply those who's done you wrong with kindness, then how would you pay, repay those who's done you right? Right, so so Confucius, he was he was very much for retributive justice, I suppose, in Western terms. If somebody, so in Christian terms, an eye for an eye. If the man takes your eye, then you then it is only just and correct that you take his eye. Right. So this is this is I mean in in, in philosophy of punishment, in jurisprudence, there there is this there's this tension. Right. Should we try to forgive and forget and move forward, which it seems to me what the TRC very much was about in South Africa in, in, in the 1990s. But from a Chinese, at least of comfortable, Confucius is probably the most well known, but he's not the only philosopher from China. I'd imagine this debate in Chinese philosophy as well. But purely from a Confucius, Confucian perspective, I think um, it's, 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 it's similar to a Kantian perspective from, um, from the German continental philosophy. It is, it needs to be equal. So he who has done you a wrong, you need to repay him uh, in, in, in right measure. So, so that, would, that would be my, 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 very, my, my understanding of how Confucius, Confucian philosophy would, 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 would contribute to, 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 the, to the question of transitional justice. Thank you. Um, Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, so I, I don't know if that, that answers. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, maybe if I can go to <laughs> Professor Wang and if you want to reflect on any of the comments or questions that were raised. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, based on Chinese history and Chinese reality, reality uh, we can find that uh, uh, the peace and the security is uh, um, a funda fundamental factors of uh, the human rights and uh, was the uh, human uh, development. So, uh, but uh, we can never find uh, uh, the peace and the security uh, will be built by extern external uh, resolution or external uh, forces. Uh, so. Uh, I think uh, the African con continent faces also the same uh, question and the same challenges. Uh, based on our Chinese experience, 
I think uh, African countries should also, uh, first of all, uh, uh, rebuild their capacity and uh, uh, mm, how to say the in, uh, international uh, intervention should follow up the, this, uh, the African countries agenda and um, should avoid to, uh, how to say, replace their own uh, object by uh, external uh, uh, interest. Uh, this is uh, what I uh, think. Thank you so much. And I'll go straight to Faith. Thanks, Gustav. I think I want to touch on, I think one of the questions raised was how to reconcile um, the tensions between, on one hand, you're seeking to deliver a revitalized notion of peace building, and on the other hand, you also need to manage the very important question of human rights. Um, and this was, was in the context of the debate around the, the crisis of the liberal peace model. I think it's important to mention also that in light of what we call the pragmatic approach of China um, towards peace and security continent, it's, it's learning on the job because this, this is also a learning experiment for it, a learning experience for it in the sense that, as we've said, there's, there's an evolving landscape. Um, new threats, emergent threats, and even hybrid threats are coming up. But I think also one cannot sidestep the bigger debate in the room, the bigger elephant in the room, which is the question of moving a bit, a lot of the debate around the post liberal um, approaches is the question of moving beyond a very state-centric state paradigm. So you cannot sidestep the question of, when talking about um, reimagining a social contract, reimagining a compact between the people and its governments in shaping, in moving towards conflict transformation, you can't sidestep the question of engaging with um, local ownership, the question of engaging with civil society. So I think that's at the heart of the debate, the civil society engagement, the, the engagement with women and youth um, also is important and, and bringing them onto the national dialogue level so that you're not delivering a pre-cooked deal. That also speaks to the question of not only mediation, but peace building um, in a larger scale. But I think also at, at the rights level and looking through the question of the rights level, even from a conflict management perspective, there's the idea of how then do you combine instruments? So yes, peacekeeping is important. Yes, uh, mediation is important, but also is the question of sanctions. And, and here it touches on the question of if you uh, want to, to effect certain change, if you want to uh, touch on pressure points particularly and, and, and change the dynamic of a particular conflict in, in influencing one or two of the belligerents, you'll have to apply on certain pressure points. One of this is sanctions, which ultimately touches on how then do you effect your economic leverage handle to shift the conflict dynamics in the favor towards maybe getting the legends onto the negotiating table. Those are some of the considerations I think that China will need to think through in its role as, as um, looking towards maybe engaging in, in, in more mediative or facilitative roles as a mediator. And on the question also of the security development nexus, I want to add in there that increasingly we are getting into a security development humanitarian nexus, um, which is important. So. You can't, you can't just overlook the humanitarian component of it just to allay some of people's suffering. And that, that kind of nexus is becoming increasingly important as part and parcel of, of um, easing up and delivering on not only improving your human protection agenda on the ground and delivering tangible results on the ground. So I'll leave it at that, um, Gustavo. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. And I'll go straight to Professor Liu for, you have three minutes. Uh, sorry, you muted. Okay, thank yes. you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I think my point is very similar. I also want to address the issue between developmental peace approach with uh, so-called value or human rights issues. I think uh, um, uh, face already almost uh, touch upon all I want to share. I very much agree with, we should uh, really think of from the nature of the current uh, 
challenges of uh, security in the continent, which is so much intertwined with development challenges. So if we think of from this point, and then uh, we notice that there have been several very uh, fascinating studies, such as uh, uh, from Senegal, Senegalese colleagues, uh, which they also have the Institute of uh, Security Studies. Uh, Professor Laurie uh, lately just uh, speak to us about uh, their um, uh, latest uh, findings through their, um, you know, lots of uh, anthropologist approaches to those uh, prisoners who due to those kind of crimes have been Prisoned and then, according based on more than 1,000 uh, interviews, and then her finding has been most of the the, the crimes uh, not necessarily they are born the terrorist. They actually develop into terrorists uh, due to the fact that they need to protect themselves, and then yet the local or the um, traditional uh, authority couldn't pro provide this type of help, therefore forced them to become a kind of a, uh, you know, violent or, or whatever you call them, those kind of a criminals. So due to this, this effect, and they also that think of the uh, the, the, the issue in Savannah as a one case and that we can uh, really understand how importantly we need to, um, you know, address this development while we are attacking and then we, why we are looking at so much uh, so-called uh, boot on the ground, this kind of a military interventions. And then I also very much agree with what uh, um, face just uh, emphasize this state-centric perspective as a one kind of a conventional paradigm. So you really have such of a um, prison as limited the actors on the ground and then how uh, as a any, you know, uh, uh, interventions, be locally or regionals or uh, external uh, uh, players like China, like US, how much you should also engage with the society and then from the starting point to learn from the society to, to know uh, their agency, as Paul rightly pointed out. So I think a very positive way to uh, motivate Africans' agency and then also to really solve the issues of uh, development uh, as the uh, very important reasons for the current security challenges is really to break this kind of a boundary to think of positively how any actors should engage the local society. And uh, yeah, I stop here. I guess my time is up. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Po, you're the last one. You have around three minutes. Uh, uh, so please just share your final remarks. Thank you. Um, I think I will uh, go for the first question, uh, which is how can African countries capitalize on that agency? Uh, I think the first point, and I'm very glad that uh, Faith is here because she was involved in an initiative uh, that put together a, a group of, uh, of thinkers, uh, of, of, of thought leaders, of African thought leaders and Chinese colleagues uh, that looked at uh, what a pan-African uh, strategy towards uh, China uh, could look like. And they identified quite a number of um, very, very interesting points. Um, uh, so I think uh, the first uh, uh, contribution that I would make is it's very important uh, on the African side uh, uh, to be very intentional in terms of developing strategy. Uh, China has very clear strategies towards Africa, has uh, come up with uh, two policy papers and uh, quite a few elements of China-Africa strategy are contained in the white papers. The white paper recently uh, that came out on uh, in 2019 uh, on, uh, on defense, uh, a white paper as well on uh, peacekeeping, uh, peace, uh, peacekeeping and peace support uh, operations and the white papers on development. I mean, so, you know, China sort of has identified very broad perspectives and it's important for the African side uh, to, do, to, do, to do likewise. Uh, secondly, um, 
Uh, I would just like to mention that, again, going back to um, um, Chinese uh, uh, culture and, 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 and philosophical culture, if we look at the, um, uh, sorry, philosophy, if we look at the Chinese approach to partnership, uh, it is really premised on the idea that uh, partners um, develop mutual interest uh, with one another uh, in, a, in, in a give and take fashion. So if you look at concepts like Guangxi, if you look at concepts like Huoban, um, these concepts are filter in the Chinese approach to strategy that allows it to partnership, that allows partners to also shape the partnership. And I think, um, like I mentioned in my remarks, there are quite a number of areas in which uh, the African Union has been able to do that, but one would like to see that becoming much more intentional. So for instance, what is the extent to which African countries uh, and African um, uh, uh, stakeholders shape the um, human resource development uh, contributions that FOCAC has been making? I mean, there are over 100,000 quotas that are provided to African countries once every three years, focusing on education, on training, on health. Uh, to what extent are those initiatives also shaped uh, by the Africa side? So I think this is what I would say that there are opportunities uh, to, to, to be more intentional in terms of developing national strategy. I know that South Africa, for instance, has um, uh, you know, a binational commission uh, with China that looks into these issues. Um, but such initiatives are really far and few between uh, on the African Thanks. continent. The third thing that I would say is the so, um, uh, civil society element, which is extremely important. Uh, it, the civil society element, uh, which is which is extremely vital in terms of academics that are able to shape some of these uh, conversations. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much. And sorry for interrupting many of you. Uh, I, I, I hate being rude, but we are actually over time now. And I wanted to first and foremost to thank for our five fantastic speakers for really engaging in a frank conversation, in an open discussion on some of the subjects that are uh, new for m a lot of our audience that it's uh, participating here, but also is something that has been repeatedly said that is there is the need for further interaction to create not only epistemic communities but also to generate more thoughts and knowledge around that. And I'm going to close those my my, my thoughts here uh, with Paul's remarks that if Africa's China security partnership and partnership in general is to be enhanced, the issue of African agency has to be much more well thought. And agency is not something that is given from the outside. Agency is something that is pursued, that is collectively pursued and individually pursued. And on that note, I would like to thank for everyone that participated in the last two days on the three sessions that we had on Africa-China security partnership looking into the future. We really appreciate you taking your time from your busy schedules uh, and having had such a wide range of participation from all parts of the globe that really makes discussions like this important to reflect on challenges and opportunities, but particularly identify potential areas of future collaboration. And finally, once again, thank you for the Chinese Embassy to South Africa for the support in organizing these events and the ISS Partnership Forum for their ongoing support to the institution. With that, I thank you very much and have a good day, evening, morning for wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much and we will see you soon.